it's my proud privilege to invite Dr. David Frawley to deliver his address. Namaste, honorable members on the dais. I just heard two very wonderful speeches and I'm very happy with the insights you are bringing into uh, this program. It is my honor to be here uh, before you today. I arrived here actually from the United States a couple of days ago and I flew in from Delhi this morning so I feel half of my being is still on the airplane. I am very happy to be in Hyderabad again. I have done a number of programs here over the years, particularly with the Pragnya Bharati back in the 1990s. One of the programs that I did, we had a debate with the Archbishop of Hyderabad, Bishop Arulapa, over the issue of conversions. I think that was in 1997. In recent years, I've continued to come to India, but I have not been so much in Hyderabad itself, so I'm happy to be back again. However, recently, as of last uh, October, I was in the Bhimle in Vishakapatnam with Sadhguru Sri Shivananda Murti, and I would like to pay my obeisance to him. He is one of the great gurus of India, and you are very, ha you are very honored to have him nearby and I recommend all of you to visit with him and uh, seek his guidance because I think he has all the real practical answers to all the human and social problems uh, today. I look forward to visiting uh, with him in the future as well. In October of 2010, with him at Beamley, we did a world conference on mundane astrology dealing with the issue of 2012 or what will happen uh, to the world in the year 2012, which various groups, including these uh, Mayan thinkers, have said would be a very crucial year for humanity. And astrologically, we can say that uh, not a lot is happening in 2012 via specific events, but we rather see a difficult era coming up for humanity in years to come. I called it in my recent newsletter, a new time of troubles, uh, not simply one cataclysmic event or big war or major outer problem, but continued pressure and problems socially, environmentally, uh, financially in the wake of so many difficulties going on in the world today. My heart goes out to the younger generation because the older generation, which I have now become part of, we really haven't left you a lot positive to look forward to. We have given you some tools, but the world in the 21st century, as our venerable Swami has said, is it a make or break crisis? I live in the United States. You think of the United States as a very progressive country, uh, which in some ways, scientifically, technologically, it is. But I'll give you an example to the mismanagement that our country has. In this last year, the United States government took in $2.2 trillion, and they spent $3.8 trillion, or nearly double the budget. If this trend continues by the year 2019, the United States will be a bankrupt country. So far, there is no plan to deal uh, with that debt. Uh, Europe also is under a tremendous debt right now, also because they had a welfare state that they were unable to fund properly. And yet at the same time, these are the countries running the global economy. And if these countries go down economically, socially, the rest of the world goes down, including India and China, and we already today see the pressure coming on India today. 
and we see India's own problems, particularly the tremendous corruption you have in this country. India has a government which has no accountability. I'm not saying this as a political criticism, but you have a government uh, overall where there is no sense of responsibility for what goes wrong or no willingness to take the blame or correct the problems going on. And we have all over the world this rapid and continued growth in consumerism. We have this tremendous growth of the media and so many unrealistic desires that people have. Now you have a generation of young people which is seeing all these technological and media-based wonders, but at the same time, many or most of them do not have the means to get these for themselves. So there is a great frustration that is brewing in the population. In India, you of course have a very large rural population, which to a large extent is not part of the economic development or boom uh, going on. And we also see that where this economic development has succeeded, Europe, the United States, the people are not at all happy. In the United States, there's an epic of a depression going on, particularly in people above 50 years old, but affecting the population as a whole. The cause of depression is very simple, it's stimulation. The more stimulation you take from the outside, the more depression you have on the inside because you're depending upon the external for your happiness. Over time, you have to continually increase this level of stimulation. The movies become more violent, they become more sensual, they become more disturbing because they need to stimulate you more. And the average human being, we're spending more time behind the box. The box is the screen, it is the computer, and our minds were behaving more like a box, were becoming more mechanical, more superficial, and more politically reactive. Even today, religion has become mainly a political phenomenon, and there is very little of sadhana left within the religions of the world today. Now, I do not want to paint an entirely bleak picture. Uh, there is always an extremity and opportunity, but there is certainly a tremendous challenge. And here also I wish to address the issue of the Hinduism or the Sanatana Dharma. And the first thing I want to say is what we call religion is largely an illusion. There are no separate religions of the world. The separate religions of the world, they're like national boundaries. You have national boundaries between India, Pakistan, China, countries of Europe, United States, and so forth. But there's no real place on the geography of the globe that these differences truly exist. They're man-made. Religion is also a man-made difference. Religion means to unite, but mostly what we call religion has served to divide people. We may have one God, but we have two humanities as the saved and the not saved, as the chosen by God, as the rejected by God. So that religion is not serving its role. When the human being takes birth, you do not have a religious identity stamped upon your body. It is something that's given to you by your society. Now in India, you have this religion called Hinduism. Why is it called Hinduism? Because it did not need to define itself against the other. You know, the other religions have their chosen people and then the outsider. The Hindus were defined by the outsider because the Hindus did not have an outside. As the Sanatana Dharma, they were able or willing to include everyone. There is not in Hinduism an address of one community. It is the Manava Dharma, Sanatana Dharma, universal Dharma, human Dharma, universal in the sense of seeking that truth which is eternal and relevant to 
all human beings. So there's essentially only one spiritual path or approach or collection of paths as the Sanatana Dharma. It is also the religion of nature in the sense that it includes all of nature, all of life, all natural, and all historical approaches to the spiritual life. And that teaching is still with us today. It has survived because of India. But that teaching was once spread all over the world. And to a certain extent, we can find aspects of it or fragments of it all over the world, particularly when we look back in time uh, to the pre-Christian, to the era before the organized religions, something like Sanatana Dharma was followed all over the world where you had the worship of the sacred fire, the sacred waters, the sacred plants, the cosmic consciousness, the light of the sun. You had living in harmony with the greater universe, not simply as a material phenomenon, but the whole greater universe of consciousness. And we see this early influence uh, in Europe through the pre-Christian traditions, the Celts, particularly the Greeks, the Romans, even the old Slavic, Germanic traditions. I also live in the United States in a part where the Native Americans are still predominant. And unfortunately, they're also still being suppressed. And in some areas, there's still genocide against them going on. But they also followed a tradition of the sacred fire, the sacred dances, the sacred chants, the honoring of the universe through the sky, the waters, the clouds. So that tradition uh, was also there. So when organized religion came onto the scene, it created one community against another. On one hand, it denied the validity of the local traditions. On another hand, it spread this idea of religion as a belief and salvation by belief. There is no salvation by belief. In fact, there is no salvation at all. Salvation is a human term. We are naturally part of that universal dharma. And we, our duty is to know that dharma, be in harmony with that dharma, and to be part of that dharma of the universe in our entire daily life. That is why Hinduism is a way of life. It is not simply a belief that you can take up in a short uh, ceremony and then suddenly you're saved because some force, some being has changed your name or changed your uh, identity. So Hinduism represents that universal religion that has pervaded all of nature and pervaded all of life. Now, even historically, Hinduism was the, a dominant religion along with Buddhism another dharmic related path. As far away as the Philippines and Indonesia to the east and well into Afghanistan, Iran, and even further to the west, even over the last 1500, 2000 years. Even Vietnam was largely a Hindu country until the 17th century. Uh, so there was that also that spread of more of the classical Hinduism, which is why you have Angkor Wat in Tibet and why, I mean, Angkor Wat in, uh, in Cambodia, and why we have so many Hindu temples and uh, monuments throughout uh, Southeast Asia. But when India itself became under siege, which it did through the foreign invasions and the mis mis uh, missionary efforts, then Hinduism also became contracted and to a certain extent closed in on itself and also unwelcoming of outsiders, because a lot of the outsiders they saw were people seeking to destroy or even plunder the country. This situation changed at the end of the 19th century with Swami Vivekananda, and Hindu teachings began to spread worldwide again. And we would have to say that a lot of the most progressive trends, at least spiritually, in the Western world over the last hundred years have their roots in the Hindu Dharma, whether it is the movement towards yoga, meditation, natural healing, 
mantra, so many things, psychological well-being, the Hindu Dharma has had a very powerful effect at the level of ideas. So I propose to you that we are also entering an, a new phase in which the Hindu Dharma can expand and grow globally in a very significant way and will continue to do so for the future. The main problem today is that the people following these things do not always know where they come from and they do not always credit India or Hinduism for it because many groups have taken these ideas and given credit to themselves for them. They put their name on it, they put their brand on it. Even in America today, there's so many brand names of yoga, they ask you, what yoga do you follow? By brand name, it's a style of asana, as if yoga was nothing but a different style of asana. So as Hinduism began to spread, again, there was a global acceptance of many of the great Hindu ideas and practices, but there was no background understanding of Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma to go along with it, for the most part. And we cannot entirely blame the teachers who brought Hinduism to the West, because Hinduism was a negative term for people in the West. In fact, I saw something very interesting. It was a document signed by the governor of the state of California in 1910 stating that Hindus were heathens, they were unclean, and they should not be allowed in the state by point of law. This was actually only 100 years ago and after the time that Swami Vivekananda had already visited the Western world. Tremendous prejudice was going on. Swami Yogananda had several threats on his life while he was in the United States. So because of that, the Hindu gurus came to the West, but they, didn't permade, they did not make Hinduism so well known. They emphasized yoga, or they emphasized their own sampradaya, or they said, I am a universal teacher, and I teach all religions, including Hinduism. I have all the religions, the people of all the religions following me. Here is where I have some critique or difference with some of the modern teachers for their way of expression. Any Hindu teacher coming, any teacher coming out of the Hindu tradition is going to have a sense of universality. But that is coming from the Sanatana Dharma itself. It is not simply coming from that teacher or from that particular sampradaya. Hinduism itself, as the Sanatana Dharma, is inherently something universal. It is not one religion among many. So one sect of Hinduism cannot say we're universal and Hinduism is just part of the many religions that are part of us. We need to resurrect that greater sense of the Sanatana Dharma behind all these great teachers and teachings. And now is the time where we can do that again not only in India, but also in the Western world. It's interesting to note that in America today, and also in UK, the Hindus are the most affluent religious community along with the Jews. The average Hindu in America makes twice the amount of the average Christian and has a much better education. That has also changed the image of Hinduism in the West, and it continues to change. We also see that as far as the pervasion of Hindu ideas, more than a quarter of the people in the United States by several surveys have now accepted the principle of rebirth and karma, even though again they may not religiously define themselves formally as Hindus. And all over the United States, for example, I live in a city of about one lakh or 100,000 people and we have over 65 yoga teachers uh, in the town. And we also have more than, I don't know, 20 meditation teachers. And there is a, when uh, Amaji comes, Sri Amrita Andamai comes to the town, often there'll be as many as 5,000 people attending her event. 
And this is in the middle of the southwestern desert. It's not in one of the major urban areas of the United States. We see a widespread interest in these ideas. So what I've been doing over the last 20, 30 years is I've been active in all these related fields of the Vedic studies, Ayurvedic medicine, Vedic astrology, yoga, Raj Yoga, Vedanta, Vedic studies, translations of the Vedas, and also this whole historical issue of the antiquity of the Vedas. And our work is to also to draw the connections between these things for people so they can see the greater Sanatana Dharma behind that. And now we are seeing more of that occurring. For example, now a lot of the yoga centers in America have Ayurveda, some will have Jyotish, then we'll now have pujas and yagyas. And we see this trend growing more and more that there is at least a realization of the Vedic connection between all these Vedic teachings and disciplines. And then we try to take them one step further and show the greater connections with the Sanatana Dharma. However, outside of India, we look at the Sanatana Dharma in a little different way in the sense that we're not looking so much at India's problems. However, I would like to state that India, of course, has its own special problems. And Hinduism seems to be more under siege inside of India than outside of India. And it seems to have less governmental support inside of India than outside of India. I have some friends in Italy who run the Italian Hindu Union. You know, up to a few years ago, Hinduism was not recognized as a religion in Italy, in spite of the Italian connections of the Indian government. Uh, so this group got Hinduism recognized so that you could have a Hindu marriage in Italy. So they had a meeting and they said, we're going to invite the ambassadors from all the countries of the world to our opening in Rome. So they did. And every, so many came, the Russian came, the all over Europe, Hungarian, British. The Indian ambassador declined to come because he said, we're a secular country, so we cannot attend this particular event. But also we see in the Western world, a very interesting phenomenon. There is overall a decline in Christianity. The churches in Italy are almost empty. The churches in Great Britain are largely being sold to other groups. The younger people in the West, particularly in Europe, are abandoning Christianity, and also to a great extent in the United States. However, there is one notable difference, which is the evangelical movement, or the American fundamentalist, we call them, and that group is growing. Even though Christianity is overall growing, that group is it's in decline. That group is growing, particularly in the United States. They haven't been accepted in Europe so far. And that is also the main group that is coming to India. And their center of, their central point is Andhra Pradesh. This is what they're doing. And it's interesting to note that they represent an educationally backward part of the American culture. They are opposed, for example, to the teaching of evolution in the schools. So we have an interesting phenomenon uh, for example, I have a number of Hindu friends in Houston in the southern United States. And a lot of their employees are fundamentalist Christians. And they were talking to some of the fundamentalist Christians. They would not allow their children to attend certain science classes because of the rejection of evolution and so forth. And so the Hindus said, and that's very good for us because that means in the next generation, you will also be working for our children because you're opting out of education. It's interesting to note that the Christianity you find in India is more backwards than the Christianity you find in the United States. What was this uh, book, The Da Vinci Code? It was banned in India, a non-Christian country. There was not a single Christian country where it was banned. And it was available at every major theater in the United States. And apart from a few grumblings by the Vatican, uh, there was no real major protest or attempts to uh, stop that. 
We also have seen in South America, which is largely a Catholic country, that now it's gone up to, at least in Brazil, 20% uh, evangelicals. And we talked to them, why did you become evangelical? It says, well, everything's easier. You go to heaven immediately. You don't have to do any sadhana. You don't have to do any work. It's salvation is by belief. And once you've accepted Jesus, you don't even need to go to church anymore. <laughs> You're free. And if you commit sins, then you just ask for forgiveness again. Some years ago, in America, uh, when they explained Christianity and salvation from sin to the Native Americans, the Native Americans said, well, uh, doesn't that encourage you to sin more? Because after all, you sin, God will forgive you. You can sin again, and God will forgive you again. But this is the group that has been causing the trouble. This is the group that uh, a lot of the Republicans are involved with. But I would also tell you it's a group that will not come to power in the United States. Uh, but it will cause some difficulties. And it is a group that is causing trouble uh, in India and is also uh, targeting the poor, as you know. And we've also found that not only in India, but in other countries of the world, because of this evangelical threat, the Catholics have also taken up the conversion cause more strongly and also the countering of the evangelicals and the Hindus. In fact, I would say lack of unity among the Hindus is one of the worst uh, causes. And we have so many Hindu organizations that will not call themselves Hindu, that will not emphasize uh, Sanatana Dharma, and that are more concerned with their own following, and rather than uniting the Hindu forces. At the same time, there are a number of groups that are doing something different. One group I've worked with a fair amount is Swami Narayan organization. Uh, they are not so prominent in Hyderabad, but they have built this wonderful Akshardham temple uh, in Delhi. And they also call themselves this uh, Swami Narayan Hindu mission. And in all their temples, they teach Hinduism. In the Delhi temple, they have a huge display on Hinduism. It's almost like a Disney world. They have a 10 minute boat ride down the Saraswati River. And all the outside of this beautiful temple, it's over 200 feet high, hand-carved marble. They have all the heads of the sampradayas of all the Hindu orders represented, even though they hold to their own sampradaya. And this is something the Hindus need to understand. You can hold to your own sampradaya and yet embrace the Sanatana Dharma as a whole. Hinduism does not require that we all look alike, dress alike, and follow the same exact set of creeds or you know, repeat the same prayer every day at the same time. That is not a sign of spirituality. That is a sign of social control and uh, domination from the outside. So it's very important that the Hindus unite. And we also need more teaching of what Hindu Dharma is. So every Hindu child, when asked these basic questions, uh, who am I, what is God, what is Dharma, what is Hinduism, why am a Hindu, how is Hinduism different than the other religions of the world, will have an answer. And I have to tell you very clearly that all religions are not the same. You know, there are certain, there's a certain type of thinking uh, that, uh, it's largely like consists, I would say, platitudes or superficial statements, like all human beings are the same. See, at one level, all human beings are the same, but at another level, all human beings are different. And the other thing is we need to introduce, in this same regard, Viveka discrimination back into Hinduism. This, you need more discrimination about the spiritual teachings you follow than about work, relationship, diet, any other aspect of life. You cannot say that all food is the same because its goal is nutrition. And it doesn't matter what food you eat or when you eat it, that everybody should be equally healthy and happy regardless of their dietary inclinations because food is one and we all need food. And yet that's what the Hindus do in the spiritual realm. They say all religions are the same because there's certain principles in common. That's not enough. 
if we look at the teachings, Hinduism is first of all a sadhana, which means individual spiritual practice. Most of the religions of the world are not sadhanas. They teach salvation by proxy, salvation through another, salvation by belief. Once a belief is accepted, and in fact there is no sadhana. That is why they have so much uh, energy for converting others, because they have no sadhana to do on themselves. <laughs> Their sadhana is to convert. That is the fact. That is how they view it. And they view it that they can save your soul. Now how can a soul be saved? Soul is a spiritual principle. How, in fact, when the Pope came to India, he said, we look to a new harvesting of souls in the upcoming millennium in India. How can you harvest a soul? Who is going to harvest it? The soul is an inviolable spiritual principle. So Hinduism is sadhana based. And why are people attracted to all these Hindu practices outside of India? Meditation, chakras, kundalini, yoga, meditation. Excuse me for a second. Yes. A small announcement. Okay. Our friends, there are two vehicles, Wagonar 3511 and item 0693. Both of the vehicles are obstructing the passage and the chairman of the institute, he wants to move. So we Thank you. I thought it was an announcement from on high. <laughs> so people want the practices. They want things to change. Now science is becoming aware of higher states of consciousness. Where are these higher states of consciousness defined, explored? Where are the practices for them? These are coming out of India from these dharmic traditions. You're not finding them in the belief-based uh, traditions. Another movement we have today in the world is the interfaith movement. And I say we need dialogue between, and dialogue and discussion between all groups is always welcome. At the same time, a lot of the interfaith movements often represent something like the political gatherings, where heads of state comes together to get more favorable trade treaties for their own country. And so the Hindus have to be realistic that uh, these differences exist, and the other religious groups are willing to exploit them. I want to put this idea before you. The Hindus are the group that has most promoted the unity of all religions, right? At the same time, Hinduism as a religion has the least respect of all these religions, including the religions that it claims unity with. Because in the other religions, it is a matter of exclusivity. It is not a matter of inclusivity. Again, I'm not saying you should criticize or be against somebody, but you need to understand what they are actually saying. Many Hindus accept Jesus and say Jesus was a yogi. In fact, Jesus may have very well been a yogi. The problem is the Christians don't believe that. <laughs> and as long as the Christians don't believe that, it doesn't help the Hindus to say because Jesus was a yogi, Christianity is yogic. Current Christianity is not a yogic system. Uh, it has different values. It has its pluses. I'm not saying there's nothing of value in these systems. And there's, I'm also not saying that Hindus cannot learn something from them. But you have to know the similarities and the differences and the strengths and the weaknesses. The greatest strengths of the Western religions is that they form greater cohesive social organizations to help and to protect their members. So joining them is like joining a protective community. And most people join the Western religions not because of the theology, but because of the social support. They get a good job, they get, a, they're, they get access to a hospital, education, or in some areas they're just protected from being attacked. <laughs> Now that you've joined them, you'll no longer be attacked as an outsider. But the theology is very simple. They do not have a theology of self-realization, God-realization, karma, rebirth. They have a very simplistic creedal view. And at a theological level, 
Hinduism is the most sophisticated of the religions, has the deepest philosophies. In fact, faith-based traditions usually do not have a philosophy. Who is the most famous philosopher in the Christian tradition is a figure called St. Thomas Aquinas. What did St. Thomas Aquinas do? He rewrote Aristotle as if Aristotle were a Christian, which of course he was a pagan. So essentially, their philosophy, theology is pagan, but they changed the name, moved a few terms around, and then put it in their own particular system. That is why the Hindu philosophy uh, is so much in harmony with the science and with the higher views. The other factor here too relative to faith is that Hinduism is not simply a faith. In Hinduism there's an emphasis on knowledge. Even the bhakti has a tremendous jnana and very deep philosophy about it. It is not simply blind bhakti or emotion. There's also a difference between bhakti or devotion and bhakti yoga. You can have devotion, but without a yoga to cultivate it, you're not taking it anywhere. So there is devotion in many people and many traditions throughout the world, but without a yoga to cultivate it, uh, it doesn't go very far. Hinduism back to the Vedas is a vidya or a way of knowledge, a cognitive science, a way of perceiving the truth, knowing oneself, knowing the nature of the universe. And in this regard, the yoga teaches us that besides the five senses and the rational mind, we have a higher intuitive ability. And that higher intuitive ability comes forth when the mind is silent, when the mind is concentrated. So the purpose of the yoga and the meditation is to silence the mind for the direct perception of truth not simply to impose an idea upon the mind, accept a belief, accept the faith, and then impose that on the nature of reality. And this is what makes Hinduism difficult because it is many complex, it's very complex and many-sided. In Hinduism, we have the largest literature of any religious tradition in the world, one that extends to medicine, science, philosophy, psychology, in fact, I sometimes say there are more religions inside of Hinduism than outside of it because the other religions have rejected things. Their identity is based upon rejection. We do not accept use of images. We do not accept this. We do not accept... In fact, it's interesting to note that in a lot of the religions of the world, mysticism is not accepted. And self-realization is also not accepted. You have to accept what the prophet, the messenger, the savior says. He is the way. You do not have a direct access to the truth apart from that. So you cannot just mechanically, in mass, convert people to Hinduism the way you can to certain other religions. It requires a change of a way of life, a way of thought, a way of perception and it requires a degree of local adaptation. That is why there is a little difference in what Hinduism is in the different parts of India and also in the different countries and places where it has gone because even though when you have a universal teaching you still have to have a local adaptation. That is one of the principles of ecology. To think globally but to act locally. One of the reasons why in Hinduism there are so many different devatas gods, goddesses, you can call them or whatever, is because there is a connection to the divine in your own local environment. There is seeing the divine presence in the mountains, the rivers, the customs, the traditions, the people around you. There is Kailas, but there is a Kailas. There's a Shiva Parvata in every place. So that makes it more complex. And because Hinduism, as we also say, is a pluralistic tradition, accepts that there are many paths. And here, too, we also have to be careful. Hinduism says that there are many paths, but it doesn't say that all paths are necessarily good or they're all necessarily good for everybody. That there are many paths does not mean it doesn't matter which path you choose. It is just the opposite. When you have many paths, it's very important to choose the right 
path. Same thing in all walks of life. Today, we have a pluralistic world. You have many choices of political candidates. Unfortunately, we don't have any good choices. <laughs> the point is, the choice does matter, whether it's food, relationship, work. You have a number of choices. It doesn't mean all the choices are good. You can make a blunder. So too, many paths is a freedom which also allows us to make mistakes. You know, in that respect, we can also look at science. We cannot say all scientific theories are correct, even if the scientist himself was a good person. That he was a good person has no bearing on whether the theory he has was correct. So these paths do exist, and we need to be very discriminating. Sometimes people come to me, they say to me, religion should I follow in order to find truth? What I tell them is follow the path that takes you most directly to self-realization and union with the divine, wherever it comes from, whatever name uh, that it has. And in this regard, there are a lot of traditions who do not, that do not have uh, such paths uh, at all. And we also have to remember there's a difference between political tolerance and holding to your inner truth. You know, at a political level, we all need to accept that there are many religions in the world, that there are, you know, many countries, many people. All these things are there. It's not for one group to impose themselves politically on another. But at the same time, Hindus do not have to give up their identity or their values to be politically tolerant. But somehow there is the idea that for Hindus to be tolerant in India, they have to give up their Hindu identity because it's offensive to certain other groups but other groups do not have to give up their religious identity in order to be politically tolerant in India. In fact, if they assert their religious identity, they are often highlighted in, as, as, as ideal political representatives of their community. In other words, you can be a very staunch Hindu in your religious life that has no bearing on, you, you can still be very tolerant. In fact, tolerance, democracy, pluralism in the political life also is something that is in harmony with the basic Hindu values. Anyway, because we recognize that the divine dwells in each person, and each person needs to find a path that works for them, there is no one path that can be imposed in mass upon everyone and that can work for the good of everyone. It is always a matter of individual sadhana and practice. So in India, their Hinduism is much more under siege. Outside of India, there is an expansion of Hindu practices. But there needs to be a greater Hindu consciousness. And overall, the common factor is that we need better education as to Sanatana Dharma and how things fit uh, together. Uh, for example, in the West, I'm often asked the question of where does yoga fit in uh, with uh, Hinduism. And in this regard, I noticed that East or West, we don't like to define things. We like to just follow certain stereotypes. For example, in India, in, if we look at Vedic text, yoga is a common term for practice. Veda is knowledge, yoga is its practice. In this regard, branches of yoga are jnana yoga, yoga of knowledge, bhakti yoga, yoga of devotion, hatha yoga, raj yoga, laya yoga, mantra yoga. There's so many yogas that way. If we look at yoga as a specific school, we have the yoga of the yoga sutras of Patanjali. Actually, the yoga darshana wasn't founded by Patanjali. The yoga darshana goes back to Hiranyagarbha. In the Gita Mahabharata, there's all talks of yoga, but there's no Patanjali mentioned there because he is a bit later figure and the teachings that he's bringing in are not something that he invented. But even that yoga, sutra yoga, is Sankhya yoga. There's also Vaishnava yoga, there's Shaiva yoga. There's so many related yogas. They have much in common, but they also have their various differences as well. And they're all rooted in the Sanatana Dharma. In fact, the Vedas themselves are mantra yoga. That is the whole foundation. In fact, the Vedas in their key mantras hold all the essential teachings that came out in the Sanatana Dharma later. 
that's a whole subject uh, in its own right. But in the course of my study of the Vedas, basically what you have, the Vedic language is a mantric language that is the language of the cosmic mind. That language cannot be turned even into classical Sanskrit that easily, much less the modern languages of the world. That's why it's hard for people to understand that. But at that level, all the deeper teachings of yoga, Ayurveda, Jyotish, everything is in Rig Veda itself. Uh, one of the uh, other movements we've had, other issues that's having developing in the, in the world today, scientifically, historically, is now there is a recognition that the human species is at least 200,000 years old on the planet. That is the current estimate today. And yet, historically, we're still working with a timeline of five to 10,000 years. So what were human beings doing the other 190,000 years? In the Hindu tradition as Sanatana Dharma, we speak of different yugas. There were different world ages. There were different eras of culture, civilization, or inner knowledge. You know, today we put so much emphasis on science and technology. When we look back historically, we judge cultures by science and technology. But what is the difference between the yogi in a cave and the caveman? The difference is the yogi, in the, cave, the yogi is a vegetarian. <laughs> but in terms of the development of consciousness, the modern scientists would not know the difference because the yogic development is something on the inside. If we can control our own minds, we can find the entire universe dwells within us. Then do we need a television set? Do we need a better screen, with, with bigger screen, with better resolution? Uh, do we need a faster technology or a better chip? <laughs> we need that inner access. So what we're having today is Hinduism has preserved that deeper spiritual, yogic, meditational, Vedic knowledge, whatever you want to call it by name. And that knowledge needs to expand to the society as a whole. That knowledge and that culture alone has the breadth and the depth to sustain a planetary culture. Local religions of one community versus another community cannot do that. We need to broaden that basis and that is where, as we say, there's a tremendous opportunity for Hinduism in the 21st century, not just simply Hinduism as the name, but the ideas, the principles, the values, the practices, the teachings, the knowledge, the wisdom. And that has the potential to help humanity overcome this great crisis that we are coming into today and that is bound to develop over the next few decades. Again, I'm not going to say we're coming to an end of the world scenario, but we have to remember that even the 20th century had major world wars in the most civilized part of the world that ended up with the genocide of nearly 100 million people. The 21st century is also going to be having its challenges and there is a potential for yet greater challenges to arise. Our current commercial culture is unsustainable. Uh, I'll also have to say that we cannot simply make business into the enemy. That is also not a solution. In fact, there are, in particular the India side, there are a lot of the corporate people will have or do have positive ideas to improve the situation. Yet at the same time, we need to move beyond commercial values. And I will have to say, that if for us religion is conversion, our religion is still commercial. It is still a religion of converting, conquering, controlling the world, harvesting, controlling outer resources. We need to give up, move out of the era of religion as separate identity, and it could move into the era of individual spiritual practice in which we accept a broad universal path teaching for all humanity which again, we can connect to Sanatana Dharma. So it's very important that this Hindu Renaissance continues to grow and develop. And now we need to bring out the greater Sanatana Dharma side and better education into the whole field of what Hinduism is so that people understand the relationship of 
darshanas, vedas, vedangas, relevance of all these teachings. And so they can articulate it. You know, one of the problems that happens to Hindus in the West is they go to school and so a teacher teaches them something negative about Hinduism. And I tell, they say, well, why are the schools doing that? I say, it doesn't matter. You should have taught your children better what Hinduism was in the first place. So when they run into the opposition, they know how to deal with it. Opposition is always there. Every group has had to struggle to gain its recognition or its identity. The Hindus can have to stand up for what is valuable in their tradition. At the same time, uh, there can be tolerance, there can be openness. We can be free to disagree or have different ideas and perceptions of truth with all due respect, just as in science as we do in religion. And it's very important that the Hindu point of view is better represented and is not just simply used as a means of uh, harmonizing or making everything the same. And there needs to be a greater sharing of all the great Hindu teachings, philosophies, different forms of Vedanta, different approaches to the divine. Hinduism is the only tradition that allows the full range of devotional practices, whether it's the worship of the divine as father, mother, brother, sister, beloved, friend, master, lord, use of images, not use of images, use of nature forms, not use of nature forms, mantras, yantras, every form of sadhana is there. The other traditions are much more circumscribed in that regard. Same thing as to the philosophical richness of the traditions. And in summary, in spite of all that has happened, today Hinduism is still the third largest religion in the world. It is the largest of the non-biblical tradition, so it carries the responsibility of preserving all the native traditions, all the traditions that all the Dharmic traditions, and all the spiritual, mystical traditions of humanity. Many of these are unknown. Many of these have been done at an individual uh, level, and also as a way of knowledge. Hinduism can preserve that link to science, to medicine, to spirituality, that whole broader universal connection. So that is why I had one friend, uh, J.C. Kapoor, he says Hinduism is not a religion, it is the cosmic connection. It allows you to make a cosmic connection to whatever it is that uh, you are doing. And there needs to be a greater renaissance and revival of Hindu thought, Hindu values, Hindu practices in India, and also an integration. There are many wonderful things being done, but there is not that sense of Hindu unity uh, behind them. And again, you can preserve your sampradaya and its values, but you can still affirm a greater Sanatana Dharma. And in the Sanatana Dharma, there always is room for another point of view as long as the emphasis is on the greater fact of dharma rather than the outer factors of difference of ideas and perceptions. So as the century develops, there will be a continual development of Hindu thought. I have no doubt about that. The main issue is how much humanity is going to have to suffer before changing to create a more sustainable a more friendly culture. And here in India, too, there are many social problems, overpopulation, lack of education. Uh, there are also uh, issues. But I will present this also before you, that whatever problems that are there in India, as well as any other country in the world, you can find a solution in the Sanatana Dharma. <laughs> the solutions don't necessarily require looking to the outside. Actually, they require looking more to the inside. And if there is this deeper development of the Hindu thought, not as a separative thing, but as of a greater approach of universality, dharma, spiritual science, then I think there is great hope for India and great hope for the coming century. But these deeper perceptions have to be brought into the elite of the culture they also have to be brought out more educationally. 
But the important thing is do something wherever you are. <laughs> wherever you are, promote a school, promote a teaching, promote a guru, do something. And whatever you're doing for the sake of the Sanatana Dharma, always bring in that greater sense of what the Sanatana Dharma is and how all the different teachers and teachings are connected. And even though we as Hindus may not see someone else as an enemy, you still have to recognize that there are those who may not see you as a friend and who may be working to undermine what you do. Be realistic in how you relate to the members of other religions. Do so in all friendliness. Uh, but remember, religion creates a very powerful samskara. And not all these samskaras are going to, are in favor of Hinduism. If you allow certain samskaras to come in, uh, they will not favor Hinduism, they will not favor a Sanatana Dharma. They will direct people towards divisive communities and they will also work to undermine certain dharmic values, even beyond the intentionality or the niceness of the person involved. Become very critical and aware of the effects of ideas, beliefs, practices, and culture combine the deepest sense of unity, but with the most powerful viveka or discrimination. And that has been the main thing that has been weakness that Hindus have created is leaving that viveka out and becoming too willing to harmonize and compromise. Dharma is not something to be compromised. You cannot compromise Dharma. Uh, you can be open to other people's points of view. So please bring these practices into your life, share them with others, bring them into your community. Uh, and you do not need to be self-effacing. This is our tradition, it is a beautiful tradition, it is a wonderful tradition. It should, be care it should be honored and cared for by all. We are not here to denigrate another, but at the same time, we do not have to denigrate ourselves in order to be here. This tradition is, I say, uh, to my point of view, the greatest that is available today, or it certainly can be the basis of that. So it's very important to give the proper honor to your own valuable teachings. And if you honor them, others will also honor them. If you compromise them, then they will not be honored by others, including by your own children. So please remember that. I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions uh, here, but I thank you for uh, giving me your attention. Uh, I have my own points of view on things. I try to harmonize at the same time, bring in some point of clarity, but it's important that whatever a speaker comes, me or someone else, that we go to a deeper level of examination. It's not a question of accepting or rejecting what the person simply has to say, but we need to set in motion a deeper vichara, a deeper inquiry, a deeper examination, a deeper study, and create a better presentation and understanding of these profound teachings and a better ability to communicate them uh, with others. So I hope that process is going on within you and continues to go on in a way that is helpful to you, your family, and your community. Uh, namaste. Thank you, Dr. Pauli. Uh, we have 10, 15 minutes of time. If some of the members from the audience have some questions, maybe you can quickly write down and send them across with the organizers who are there. I request you to be direct and brief on the question so that he will be able to answer and then many more people would get the opportunity to clarify their doubts. Now this is not a seminar, nor this is a symposium. It is organized as a, a session wherein we would like to hear Dr. Fowley. Maybe there could be another 
fora, another symposium where you know we could have that type of discussion, but the time is not structured for such a discussion. Therefore, I requested you if you have specific points on which a clarification could be given. Thank you. Is dharma static or dynamic? Dharma is based on a universal principle, but there's always a local adaptation. Everything has to be adapted towards time, place, and person, because there are also individual variations that are going on. But that adaptation is not a compromise. See? That is the point. Uh, for example, even relative to dietary factors, you have to make sure to have food that's appropriate to the place and the season and the, the time and place where you live. But that doesn't mean you're compromising the nutritional value of the food. And dharma is not just a fixed principle. It's not a belief. It's not an absolute you impose upon things. It's a way of understanding how things work. Dharma fire is to burn. Dharma water is to be wet. Uh, so in that regard, adaptation of dharma and non-compromise of dharma go together. Hinduism is related to previous birth. Do you believe in this? Well, all of our karmas are related to previous births because we're setting these motions in force in, in the movement of time. But as a soul, the soul exists beyond the movement of time. So karma is everything that we do. And so what happens is we forget in the present birth the karma is set in motion in the past birth and then we blame someone else or society for it. Okay, I don't think we can answer all these questions. <laughs> A few. Okay, what is your definition of the Sanatana Dharma? As he was saying, Swamiji earlier, Sanatana is eternal, but Sanatana also means perpetual. So it implies adaptation. It also implies universality, for example. And Sanatana Dharma is not based on, is inclusive of all dharmas. So it's not based upon uh, just one dharma alone. And dharma itself is the natural law or nature of things in the universe, uh, with his, which is both uh, practical and uh, ethical in nature. It's Hinduism. I think we have enough questions to answer by him now. My request you to kindly refrain because we don't have so much of time. We wish that each one of you are good enough to come and speak here, but the program is not structured for such an opportunity and we have to kindly put up with the small inconvenience and to the extent that we have received the questions, we request him to address them. If you want to speak with him personally, I think that could be arranged separately, but <laughs> see here, please, please, we'll try to answer as many as possible. Kindly understand the difficulty of the organizers. I, I'm not the organizer. I'm like one of you here. I also have 100 questions to answer and get these answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree, sir. I agree with you. I agree. I know, I know, I know. No, no, you see. No, see, I, I agree. No, no, you see. No, no, please, please understand. 
I, I think you have already made your point. Let us request the speaker to answer the questions. Okay. Yeah, what? Yes. I didn't understand this question, but uh, okay. Including through the Voice of India, and a number of these books are available online at no charge. Uh, the more re we have a more recent. Universal Hinduism. Well, there's a whole set through the uh, Voice of India. And uh, even this uh, Arise Arjuna has gone through nine printings in India already. And then in the Swami Narayan Akshar Dham in Delhi on ancient India, there's a whole book called Hidden Horizons that they give out. They give out to many people who have come. They've distributed more than 20,000 copies on India's cultural heritage. And we have others through other publishers. So we do have books and online articles. We've addressed a lot of these things uh, that way because I know I'm not going to be able to, to address all these particular questions today. And there are many other authors and uh, writers who have addressed a lot of these issues. Uh, Ram Swarup and Sita Ram Gol and uh, many others that can also, you can also look for uh, their writings as well. Now to get back to few questions that we have here. Someone's asking about the Mayan calendar, which says the world would come to an end on December 31st, 2012. Uh, usually, if you're going to predict the end of the world, make sure to make it a few years down the road so that you can financially benefit from your prediction before it fails to occur, <laughs> because the world continues. But as I say, our view is that we're coming into a difficult transitional, we are in a difficult transitional era where we have developed a certain uh, technological and scientific knowledge, but not the spiritual wisdom to deal with it. And so what's happening is that uh, the destructive effects or the, or the debilitating effects of this technology are now starting to come into play. So that inner wisdom needs to be developed. Hinduism can be very helpful in doing that. Uh, will Hinduism survive against evangelism in the future? One of the interesting things about the evangelical movement in America is that often the children of the evangelicals revolt against them. <laughs> So their ability to hold their own generation to go on for more than a generation or two is not very good uh, because they offer people a kind of end of the world scenario of quick salvation, but life goes on. And they also have very narrow moralistic views which alienate people. And one thing I would say to Hindu groups too is don't embrace petty moralistic causes. It just makes you look narrow-minded. Uh, there are moral values. I'm not saying that, that that is not important. But don't make it, don't make narrow causes like that. The better cause is to improve human behavior, honesty, integrity, and all the rest of it. So Hinduism will survive against evangelism, but evangelism is, is causing some bumps in the road. It's also challenging you to create better and more effective communities and education. Because people are not leaving Hinduism because of spiritual practices and philosophy. They're doing it because someone can offer more, better mundane rewards. And the fact is, if you went to any poor community anywhere in the world, a lot of people would convert on financial reasons alone if they had that particular uh, opportunity. Do you think that Hinduism in India is in real danger? Uh, there are, as we say, very major difficulties uh, coming out. There are also many positive developments that are uh, coming up. But the danger is certainly real. But I will tell you that every religious community in the world feels threatened. Whether it's the Christian, even the evangelicals feel quite threatened. They feel that they are being compromised and uh, uh, the American government's against them, all the rest of it. So everybody feels threatened to some degree. But I would say the, the Hinduism is going to survive. The question is, is it going to reach its full flowering? Or is it going to maintain the population base that it has? And that requires more work. Because we live in an area, we live in an era 
with this commercial mind, everything becomes very simplistic. Slogans. And so slogan-based religions are easier to promote than a sadhana-based tradition. So the challenge is greater education in Hinduism to meet that. And if Hinduism is taught in the right way, it will appeal to the elite. Uh, if it's not taught in the right way, it will uh, uh, suffer. At the same time, there are many great teachers today, and there are many good movements coming up. Swami Dayananda has also done some very good work relative to uh, books on Hinduism, explaining the Hindu Dharma, and uh, this is a movement I think will continue uh, to grow. Let's see. Your take on Hinduism and vegetarianism. It's interesting to note that there are, have been historically many Hindu communities that are not predominantly vegetarian. Uh, for example, we go to the Himalayas a lot. And the, particularly in the Kumawan, it's standard to eat goats. In fact, the, when the, someone becomes a head of the Kumawan regiment, they have to sacrifice a goat at a certain Kali temple uh, in, uh, you know, in the Almora area. The point is that Hinduism is open to all people. At the same time, it promotes nonviolence. And uh, you have to understand that there are certain communities that historically were more dependent upon eating meat, the Tibetans also have had a community that eats meat, some of the mountain communities. So there's not necessarily a ban. You can't say that because someone's not vegetarian, they can't be a Hindu. Uh, at the same time, Hinduism says that it's, Im it's important to reduce the amount of violence that's going on in the world. And I also should say that relative to ahimsa, Hindu Hinduism has never taught that there's no kshatriya at dharma, that there's no need to, that it's wrong to defend yourself. Ahimsa means reducing the amount of harm going on, and sometimes it's necessary to take a stand. That's what we are taught in the Mahabharata, for example. But at the same time, one only resorts to forceful resistance as, a la as, as you see in Mahabharata, as the last possible resort, not as the first uh, option. And today there are generally uh, many other options that can be taken. How, how does Hinduism address the hmm? how does Hinduism address the uh, women in India? Uh, he says now in India the feminist movement has been emerged as a social freedom movement. India is a very interesting country because in Hinduism there is the greatest honoring of the feminine aspect of divinity that we have in any religion of the world. For example, many of you know of, in, for example, the evangelicals don't have even, they don't even recognize Mary. In the Catholic tradition, Mary is not the divine mother, she is the mother of Jesus. She is not like the divine mother in Hinduism. She doesn't create, preserve, destroy the universe. She just simply intercedes with her son. So Hinduism has that broad view of the feminine spirituality but I would have to say that there are still many parts in India where women are not educated properly, where women are not honored properly, and where there needs to be more work to uplift the role of women in the uh, society. And at the same time, a lot of the feminist values that are coming in uh, are not spiritually sensitive to the Hindu tradition or to the spiritual role of women. And they also tend to cast women in a more commercial or masculine model in which these deeper feminine values are also lost. But it's also true that it is the women who have probably uphold Hinduism better throughout the centuries because they have been more devotional in nature and they have educated the children, they have done the Puranas, they have done the chanting, and also later on in life they will also be uh, more uh, religious. And we come from a tradition in Hinduism of worship of the Devi and Shakti. Shakti must be honored for the Hinduism to rise. Shakti must be given its place. Shakti is not simply the feminine principle, it is the pr it's the principle of energy, 
the principle of the uh, honoring the manifestation, honoring the form. Well, one more thing I should add. My wife uh, also writes, and she has two books on the Devi, which are bestsellers in India, Yogic Secrets of the Dark Goddess and Yogini, a CD of uh, chanting. So many powerful Hindu women. Yes. Well, what's happening? Yeah. How you see the, the America becoming a spiritual country? Well, what's happening in the West is people have had a lot of material affluence, and it has not made them happy. So they're looking for some alternatives. They've had these religions of belief, and they haven't given them. They've given them. They say, "Oh, you're saved," but they don't. It hasn't given them higher knowledge. So there is the movement there for people who want any spirituality to look to the East, the Hindu traditions, the Buddhist traditions, Taoist traditions, and so forth. So that is, been, that is coming up in the uh, Western culture. Of course, it's may, it will take time to develop, but there is a slow spiritualization of the culture uh, that is going on, and I will expect that to grow in the future. Yeah, East is getting technology, and uh, the West is getting some degree of spirituality. So some degree of balance can, can occur. At the same time, we, we can't look at technology as the enemy. We have to learn how to use it properly. Technology can make our outer life simpler if we use it properly. But we shouldn't use it to multiply unnecessary desires. And we have to remember that however good our technology, we're still born of nature. It's more, you'll always find more peace taking a walk in the mountains than watching the latest movie. <laughs> yes. Well, what, what's happened in the Western culture is there's been a fragmentation of the society. And so the family system has broken down. Now in America, people above 50, over half of them are living alone. Yeah, and that's a tough situation. So there's, and to some extent, there's more psychological suffering in the Western world than in the Eastern world. And at the end of the day, psychological suffering can be worse than material suffering. They did some studies of who is happy in the world. And they found out that people in poorer countries generally are more likely to say they're happy than people in wealthier countries. Yes. 